mystery, history, cryptid creatures, and paranormal activities. This is the Creeps and Crawls Mystery Hour Podcast, and I'm your host, Creeps. Okay, guys, so this one, I will admit, I had no clue about. I even... (laughs) I learned about this one from an episode of Seinfeld, of all things. In this episode, Kramer is in a bet with a gentleman over flights and their patterns, and who will take off at what time and if they'll be on time. But the man wants leverage, and... (laughs) It's kind of hard for Kramer because he doesn't have money, so he calls up his good friend Newman, who comes in with a bag that belonged to, in his own words, the evilest serial murderer to ever come out of the Postal Service, son of Sam David Berkowitz. And when asked where he got the messenger bag, he proclaims that he took up the serial murderer's route and stumbled upon the bag. Now... I wasn't sure if this was a real story or not, so I went digging, and apparently it is. David Richard Berkowitz, born Richard David Falco, was born June 1st, 1953, and was also known as the Son of Sam, as well as the 44 caliber killer. He is known for being an American serial killer who pled guilty to eight shootings that began in New York City. July 29th, 1976. His mother, when he was just born, decided to give him up for adoption because the child wasn't legitimate because his father, Joseph Joseph Kleinman, was already married and the baby's murderer to be adopted was to be adopted by Pearl and Nathan Berkowitz of the Bronx. The Jewish American couple were hardware store owners and they were of a modest lifestyle. They were the ones who decided to change his name to the name we know him by now. And raising young David as their own and a journalist wrote, the child was somewhat troubled and above average intelligence. But despite how smart he was, he lost interest in his education at a young age and became obsessed with petty larceny and starting fires. He had suffered numerous head injuries as a child, and neighbors recalled him to be a difficult and spoiled bully, and his new parents consulted, at the very least, one psychotherapist due to his misconduct. But the misbehavior continued but despite his misconduct never resulted in legal intervention or even a serious mention of his school records. When he turned 14, his mother had died of breast cancer and his home became strained because his father decided to remarry and he hated his stepmother. He went on to graduate in the year of 1971 and moved into a four and a half room apartment and lived there for several years going to college nearby, and he would later join the army and serve at Fort Knox in the U.S. after his honorable discharge in June 1974, he went on to locate his birth mother, Betty, and after a few visits, she disclosed the details of his birth, and he would have rather not have heard them. He was very distraught at the array of reluctant father figures in his life, and this would later be issued as a primary crisis in his life, a revelation that shattered his sense of identity and his communication with his birth mother would later fall out. He remained in communication with his half-sister, Roslyn, and attended the Bronx Community College for a year and became the driver for a co-op city taxi company but he would go on to be put into many non-professional jobs at the time of his arrest. He was working as a letter sorter for the U.S. Postal Service. Berkowitz had originally decided he would attempt murder using a knife and would later on decide to a handgun and begin his lengthy crime spree, and in the New York boroughs of the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens, he would seek out young female victims. He was reportedly mostly attracted to white females with dark wavy hair, and all but one crime scene involved two victims. 
He was infamous for committing some of his attacks while the women sat with their boyfriends in parked cars, and he showed that he enjoyed his crimes by often returning to the scene when Berkowitz was 22 years old, he was committed to his first attack. On Christmas Eve of 1957, uh, 1975, excuse me, when he used a hunting knife to stab two women in Coap City. The first was a Hispanic woman and was never identified by police. The second was a 15-year-old, Michelle Fortman, a sophomore in a high school, whom he stabbed six times and whose injuries were serious enough for her to be hospitalized for a week. He was not suspected of these crimes and would later move away from the area in July of 1976. The first shooting connected to Berkowitz would occur in Pelham Bay neighborhood of the Bronx, where at around 1.10 a.m. on July 29th, Donna Loria, 18, an emergency technician, and her friend Jody Valenti, a nurse, were sitting in Valenti's double-parked car discussing their evening at Peach Trees. And as Loria opened the car door to leave, she noticed a man hastily approaching. Startled and angered by the man's sudden appearance, she said, And I quote, <laughs> What is this? The man produced a gun from a paper bag he was carrying, and crouched, bracing one elbow on his knee, he aimed the weapon with both hands and fired, killing her instantly. Valenti, however, was shot in the thigh, and the third bullet missed both women. He turned and strutted away just as quickly as he had come, and Valenti would survive her head injury, but claimed to not have recognized her friend's killer. She, however, said, He was a white man in his thirties, with a fair complexion, standing at around 5'8", and weighing probably around 200 pounds. His hair was short and dark and curly, a mod style, and was this description would be confirmed by Loria's father, who claimed to see a man similar to this in a yellow compact car parked nearby, and neighbors would corroborate that this as well, that an unfamiliar yellow compact car had been roaming the area before the shooting, and later an imprisoned Berkowitz in 1993 would admit to this crime. Then, in October of 1976, a similar shooting occurred in a schedule in a secluded area of Flusing, Queens, next to Brown Park, where Carl De Niro and Rosemary Keenan were sitting in Rosemary's car when the window suddenly shattered. Carl described it as the car suddenly exploding, and Keenan would quickly start the car and speed away for help and the couple hadn't noticed that they had been shot, and despite Carl bleeding from a bullet wound to the head and Rosemary sustaining superficial, superficial wounds, Carl would eventually need a metal plate to repair the missing skull piece from the bullet wound, and police would determine that the bullets were a forty four caliber, but they were so deformed that they found it unlikely that they would ever be linked to a weapon in particular. And more shootings like this one would occur in November of 1976. Dom Donna DeMassi and Joanne Lormino were walking home from a movie short shortly after midnight when a man dressed in military fatigues approached them, asking for directions, when he suddenly pulled a revol bleh, revolver on the victims and shot each victim once. And as they fell to the ground injured, he fired several more times, striking only a house before running away, and as a neighbor heard gunshots, he rushed out of his house, seeing a blonde man gripping a pistol in his left hand. Demasi was shot in the neck, but the wound was not fatal, and the mono was hit in the back and was eventually rendered paraplegic. In January of 1977, Christine Frund and her fiancé John Deal were sitting in John's car near Forest Hills in Queens, and when three gunshots hit Gunshots hit his car. In a panic, John drove away, only to find that he had suffered superficial injuries while his soon-to-be wife was shot twice and died several hours later. 
and this one was the first to link the prior attacks. On March 8, 1977, around 7.30 p.m., Virginia Vos Vo Voskerchain was walking home from school when she was conf confronted by an armed man. She lived a block from where one of the prior victims had been shot, and in a desperate move to defend herself, she lifted her textbooks between herself and her killer, but the makeshift shield was pierced and the bullet struck her in the head and eventually killed her and on march 10th a press conference was held that declared that all the shootings were done by the same man and while these are not his only crimes he would be eventually brought in on august 10th 1977 when police investigated his car which had been parked outside his apartment where a gun had been seen in the back seat and when the car was searched, they found a duffel bag filled with ammo, maps of crime scenes, and a threatening letter addressed to an inspector, Timothy Dowd, who was part of the Sun and Sam task force. And police decided to stay and wait for Berkowitz to leave his apartment, rather than risk a violent confrontation in a narrow hallway. They also waited to obtain a search warrant for his apartment, worried that their search may be challenging in a court. And at 10 p.m., when he entered his car, police apprehended him with Detective John Feltico pressing a gun close to his temple and another pointing a gun at him. And in a paper bag, the 44 caliber Bulldog revolver, the type identified by ballistics, was found next to Berkowitz in the car, which is enough for a brief confession of, well, you got me, and a smile out of Berkowitz's face. They had all they needed to bring this sick, sadistic bastard in, but not before this conversation happened. Now I've got you, the detective asked questioningly to Berkowitz. Who have I got? You know, he said in a soft, sweet voice. No, I don't. You tell me. The man turned his head and said, I'm Sam. You're Sam? Sam who? Sam. David Berkowitz. And... It said the detective got a chill down his spine from the man as they took him away, and after a lengthy trial and his lawyers trying to convince him to let them off as not guilty by reason of insanity, which he attested to as false, which was thrown away because he was found fit to stand trial, and after he tried to throw himself out of the seventh-story courtroom window, he was sentenced as guilty and sentenced to 25 years for each murder. He is now known as a model prisoner and is set to stand a hearing to see if he can be let off on parole in 2024, where they will decide if he has served enough time in jail. But I don't think he should leave, and neither does he. He is... <sighs> He is said to have become an, evangel an evangelical Christian in his time in jail, and says the things he did were horrible, and he deserves to rot in jail. But what do you think? Please comment down below, and remember to stay creepy, my friends.